Good morning, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, Magnetic Reversal News, and Shinrin Yoku. Bringing you a Grand Solar Minimum update Wednesday, April 27th at noontime, Mountain Time, 2022. We are currently, boom, popping off the floor into geomagnetic storm, and we'll get to that. But the big story, near record to record cold is forecast for the next few days, as well as snow. Keep calm. It's boom time. Last weekend's warmth seems like a distant memory in the Northeast as freezing conditions and even some snow chill the region into late week. Sounds like a cold week in the Northeast. Record-breaking snow as well comes down in western New York. Cover up your grill and save the gardening for the weekend because snow has come down once again in western New York. In fact, record-breaking snow, the previous record snow for April 27th was just 2.2 inches. Set in 1931, but as of 5 a.m., snowfall had reached 1.2 inches. Cinches. So they're breaking records as we head into May. And the winter like chill to close out April in the Northeast. As has been the case often in the spring, another blast of chilly air is on the way for the Northeast. Just when many residents have been hoping that the warmth would fully take over. That's not happening. Take a look at this. Afternoon high temperatures, 20 to 40 degrees lower than Sunday. And that will be a fun day. This is midweek. And there will be some spotty rain and snow. And we'll get to those models in just a moment. Quick recap of South Dakota's wild, wild spring. Hail, tornado, high winds, and blizzards. And that means, well, trailers are being flipped over by Mother Nature. And here's the report. 16 inches of snow fell on Casper Mountain with 80 mile per hour gusts that drove the blizzard over I-90 and shut down all those roads. And that was a record for the date on Saturday of 13.5 inches on mountain. So more records falling, including Jay Peak in Vermont extending its season with a hairy fat guy to represent 300 inches of snow. No idea why they picked that. But... You love the warm weather. May forecast is not your friend, especially if you live in the north. And these monthly temperature outlooks come out often. And here is the May 2022 outlook. And it's looking below normal for all those places that are in that blizzard region, North Dakota, eastern Montana, as well as the tip of Minnesota. And all the way down, it's looking like below normal for Indiana and Ohio. So heads up, Mr. Crouch. Your bees are going to be chillified. April snowstorm damages local vineyards. It's too early to tell the extent in Oregon, but this isn't the only place where they're having difficulty with crops. And with this low record low coming near Michigan, the fruit crops may not handle the near record freezing temperatures so well. And they're showing some grapes there. So heads up, cover your crops, miss them if you need, need to, because a major recession is coming. So not only are we going to have crop losses, supply chain issues, but according to the big guys, a major recession is coming. And this isn't news. We've been warning that these things would happen six years ago. Now, Cap Allon over at Electroverse is talking about century-old lows falling across Iowa, Toronto's delayed spring, as well as La Nina struggling to break. And it's even expected. There's that cold plume. Take a look at this jiffy. That is some, this is the temperature anomaly. This is below normal. So the, those purple regions are going to be cold. So heads up. And here are some record temperatures on the 26th and 27th. These are record lows, folks, coming from cool wicks. These are the unofficial record lows. And there are, well, it looks to be over 100, hundreds of them. And let's see if we got a La Nina graph here. Yeah, meteorologist Dennis Todi, director of the USDA Midwest Climate Hub in Ames, says experts expect La Nina to fade this spring. Moreover, they had expected La Nina to fade. But La Nina conditions commenced in mid-2020 and then made a surprise return in 2021 with Noah infamously tweeting, she's back. But for La Nina to persist, persist through 2022 would be something really quite unusual. It would be a trifecta. And you have multiple years in La Nina. It's a very rare event. 
and it could stay below that threshold. So we did report on it a little while ago. And let's get to the forecast. A prolonged period of fire weather concerns down in the Four Corners region, especially on the state line, New Mexico, Arizona. So heads up down there. These conditions are from strong winds and low relative humidity. And you're going to see in just a moment that almost no precipitation is going to come into this region for the next 14 days. So that's bad news. A deepening coastal low will keep much of New England with inclement weather and rain showers, gusty winds, and even some snow. And there are a boatload of frost and freeze warnings. So click on your county for more information and cover those sensitive plants because it's going to get chilly. And we'll walk this through. Here is Thursday. Into Friday morning, you can see heavy snow in northern Maine, snow in Adirondacks, in the uh, lake effect snow belt regions, as well as snow moving into the northwest. All good news. Let's just move this through real quick. Saturday and Sunday, we're going to be having uh, most of the global warming goodness will be falling out here in Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. And then again, Ontario is going to get hit with some more snow and more snow in the northwest. And there's that cold region as the first week of May looks to be that most of Wisconsin could be picking up an inch of snow. Take a look at that. That's May 5th and 6th. So snowy pattern continues for the U.S. Now the total accumulated precipitation, we're going to take a quick look at here. And you can see Arizona is bone dry. And so fire weather threat for Southern Cali and Arizona, Southern Nevada, potentially, this is going to be the area where any big fires are going to grow rapidly over the next 14 days. So if you're in this region, don't flick your cigarette butts out the window. Now, underwater volcano in Antarctica triggers 85,000 earthquakes. The swarm of 85,000 earthquakes was the strongest seismic outburst ever recorded in Antarctica. A long dormant underwater volcano near Antarctica has woken up, according to many. And this swarm, which began in August 2020 and subsided in November of that year, was the strongest earthquake activity ever recorded in the region. And the quakes were likely caused by a finger of hot magma poking into new crust, new research finds. There have been similar intrusions in other places on Earth, but this is the first time we have observed it here, the co-author Simone Sessa, a seismologist at the GFC German Research Center for Geosciences in Potsdam, said. Now, the swarm occurred around the Orca Seamount, which is considered an inactive volcano that rises about 3,000 feet from the seafloor. But based on this seismicity, the Orca Seamount, well, might be coming or there could be another. See this caldera in here? See that little circle? That could be the region that could be re-erupting. So here's the Orca Seamount. Here's the seismic unrest south of King George Island. And we could see a large underwater volcanic eruption in Antarctica soon. According to the data, seismic update. No quakes of notes and blood echoes in Papua New Guinea of 5.2 at 120 kilometers. And out here at the Kermadec Islands, as well as in Chile, 4.9. So very low seismicity on the map, which is good news. Worldwide Volcano News Update, we have Navado de Ruiz, 23,000 feet. Popo Catapeto, 19,000. Sabancaya to 25, Fuego to 17. Sabancaya, Volcanian activity continues. No other significant eruption. Krakatoa is still puffing, but just to around five, 8,000 feet. Um, nothing significant on the globe, but we are currently in geomagnetic storm and just came off of another sea flare. Right there. It's a pretty high level sea flare, long duration, long-ish, lasted for about three or four hours. And you can see this is a, the first of two coronal holes that are gonna be coupling with us. Happened about five, six hours ago, and it drove up that plasma speed up into 500 kilometers per second, which tilted the magnetometer. And so we shouldn't get above KP5 here. This could be it. Drop down to four. Maybe there'll be a reverberation, but we pop from one to five very rapidly. And the next coronal hole stream could be a little bigger. And that should couple with us Friday, according to the experts. And that means Aurora. If it stays in KP5 for until tonight, we're going to have a nice Aurora band moving through Canada. So go outside and look up. Now, the Ukraine war could cause the biggest price shock in 50 years, according to the World Bank. And we just showed you 
that other foreign banks think we're about to head into a big recession. So you think it's a good idea to start growing your own food, perhaps, or stockpiling some, some preps or supplies? I think so. Especially when a potentially hazardous asteroid twice the size of the Empire State Building will skim past Earth tomorrow, according to NASA. It will blaze past us at 23,000 miles per hour. Now, luckily, this object is going to be about eight lunar distances away, but it's a big one. The asteroid name 418135 or 2008 AG33 has estimated diameter between 1,150 and 2,560 feet. And it will break into Earth's orbit at a blistering 23,300 miles per hour. Now, thankfully, no one's up there to noodle with this. But in the near future, people are going to be up there. Like China is going to conduct asteroid deflection tests in 2025. Well, what could go wrong with that? Now, I know China might be the capital of ping pong. But when it comes to ping pong and asteroids, I don't want to be part of that game. Do you? And for those looking for a killer solar cycle progression, I got it. I got almost every solar cycle laid on top of each other where you can glaringly see how cycle 24 is, well, the weakest in centuries, at least in 24 cycles. And I'll leave you links to the paper as well. A semi-automated method to reveal the evolution of each sunspot group in a solar cycle. And based on these predictions, Cycle 25 should have a single large peak and drop off rapidly. And that's it. I said it. Now the far side of Mars is rocked by two of the largest Mars quakes ever recorded. This may sound astounding or unique, but it's not. We've only been listening to earthquakes on Mars for a few years. And here's the paper. The far side of Mars, two distant Mars quakes detected by InSight. Uh, we guess we'll have to accept that. Now, you can see where these quakes are located far away from the InSight lander, and most of the quakes they've been uh, locating are close to InSight, but these are far away. And for over three years, the Mars quake, for over three Earth years, the Mars quake service has been analyzing data sent back from the seismic experiment for the interior structure of Mars. The seismometer placed on the surface of Mars by NASA's InSight lander. And by 2021, the Mars Seismic Catalog included up to 1,000 events. So these events are not unique. They don't indicate uh, a, some kind of a galactic wave coming at us uh, about to hit Earth. They mean nothing. In the three-year window of studying Mars quakes, they've detected over 1,000 of them. These just happen to be the two largest. And they might not even be significant in any way because we've only been up there three years. Maybe in another 30 years of data, we'll know how significant these quakes are. But there is not a single human on Earth that can say that these matter in any way other than their Mars quakes, period. And that's based on science. Here's another great paper coming out uh, in recent days. The observational evidence of ring currents in the magnetosphere of Mercury. And they're blaming it on, geo on the sun blasting geomagnetic, blasting solar flares at the planet, and then geomagnetic storms being detected. They, they present evidence here in this paper of geomagnetic storms in Mercury's magnetosphere. And this is all based on the messenger magnetic field observations made just before the probe impacted the planet. So pretty interesting that Mercury has a magnetic field. It's a hot planet being that close to the sun, and it's being bombarded by radiation but not as much as it could be because it has a magnetosphere based on these findings. So that's an interesting development. Another interesting development, NASA's going to Uranus. I said it. And they will spend $4.2 billion and $4.9 billion on a new flagship mission to the ice giant. It's exactly what we need to be spending more money on. A 35-year trip to nowhere. I mean, these things are far away. And the Large Hadron Collider restarts to push physics to the edge. The edge of bankruptcy, perhaps, because this is another billion-dollar funnel we just chuck money in and get nothing in return. Thanks, taxpayers. Now, it's Weed Wednesday, and for decades, the entire world has been spraying poison on our food, and it might not even be necessary. 
New technology using blue light has shown that you can eliminate weed seeds and control weeds using nothing more than light. It's groundbreaking and probably won't catch hold because, well, the fertilizer and chemical companies are just too big. But take a look at this technology. It's totally awesome. Plants need light to... Plants need light to survive and grow, but too much can also be a bad thing. Today on Weed Wednesday, meet the scientists in Ohio hoping to use blue light as a weed destroyer. This shower of chaff may be the future of weed control. So in terms of mechanical attachment, it's literally just going to be um, how it adapts and bolts in to the rear section. The team at Global Neighbor is using high intensity blue light and heat to kill weed seeds on their way through the combine. That's where we use short durations of light at high intensity to alter a plant's growth. We can make it die, so we can we make doing? a weed seed not grow, or we can make that seed grow faster. It's an idea that started several years back. We got a small business investment research grant uh, from Edwards Air Force Base. They were trying to uh, control plant and defoliate plants without uh, using chemicals and not disturbing the desert crust. The target, tumbleweed seeds in the California desert. Then a farmer in Iowa heard about it and asked for help fighting water hemp. I think if you could do kill those, you could probably kill kill my seeds as well. We found if we warm the seed up to a certain temperature and then flood it with blue light, we can damage the, the cells that control the reticle growth and then therefore that seed won't become a plant. The team went to work creating a system that bolts onto the combine, destroying weed seeds on their way out the back. As the years go on, as you're putting less weed seed back into the field because more and more of them are becoming disabled. Blue light in smaller doses is also good at supercharging seeds. We also found if we dial back that blue, but still warm up the seed, we can actually get the seed to get out of the ground faster. This was at two seconds, this was at five seconds, and over there you can see it was 10 seconds. And they're even looking at ways to build a system to replace chemicals for cover crop burn down. As you can see, there was some damage done uh, to the two second crop, but when you, by the time you get to the 10 second treatment, you can see that the ryegrass is, is dead. I'm an Absolutely amazing. And this technology could change the way that we stop polluting the earth with chemicals and begin to embrace nature and increase abundance while decreasing toxins. This is going to increase the biodiversity in our soils and make food more nutrient dense if we can just get this idea off the ground and start using light for everything we need in agriculture. Absolutely fantastic. Another thing we need in agriculture is more CO2. Here you can see that there is this is the CO2 concentration starting back in 1895 to present, and this is the global temperature, which you can see has dropped off quite precipitously about a decade ago. So those are the facts. <laughs> we'll leave you links below. And also leave you links to 500 million years of unrelatedness between atmospheric CO2 and temperature. All of geologic history, in fact. Here you see the temperature proxy going down, down, and down. And the CO2 is all over the place. When it spikes here, temperature's dropping. When it spikes here, temperature's dropping. So there is no correlation between CO2 and temperature, except in the minds of buffoons. And that's a boom to knowledge. Proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. We thank each and every one of you for watching this video. We thank all the heroes that share this video. Subscribe if you haven't. Become a Patreon and support the work we do. We love you. Be safe. And that's a boom. Mm -hmm.